Good evening, everyone. We are again here at the Loft Cinema. We are grateful to be here and we are grateful to see all of these faces here tonight. And I also want to greet all of our online guests as well. Thank you all so much for being here for our fourth 2023-2024 Archaeology Cafe event. Um, this program and especially this season could just as easily be called Preservation Archaeology Cafe. Preservation archaeology is at the heart of our mission and practice. But what does it mean exactly? Well, in our view, it's a holistic and conservation-based approach to exploring and protecting heritage places while honoring their diverse values. Our vision is that heritage places, ancestral landscapes, and associated knowledge are valued, stewarded, protected, respected, and celebrated across the U.S. and the world. But before we dive into tonight's program, let us take a moment to acknowledge and honor the land on which we are gathered. We recognize that we here in Tucson are on the land, on the homelands of the Tohono O'odham Nation and the lands of the Pascuyaki tribe. And we encourage all of you to take a moment to reflect on whose lands you are on tonight. I'd like to welcome tonight's presenter, Michael Kotutua. Johnson. He is a Hopi farmer, a University of Arizona faculty member, and an assistant specialist within the School of Natural Resources and the Environment. His presentation tonight is entitled Indigenous Agriculture, Planting for Survival. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Johnson, and thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> So, you know, I, I kind of wanted to give just a little bit brief of background about myself, you know, like I always like to say that I'm a 250th generation farmer, 250th generation. You know, somebody asked me, how can I prove that? And I said, let's just look at the archaeological record, you know, because I think that's important. And so, you know, I was, when I meet my friends from Iowa at Nebraska University, that was, we sit around and have lunch sometimes and they tell me how long their family's been farming, what generation they are, but when they drop their mouth on I say, yeah, I'm a little bit older than that. And so that's the cool thing. But, you know, I'm an assistant specialist at the University of Arizona at the School of Natural Resources and the Environment, but I'm also affiliated with the Indigenous Resilience Center, which is very important because we're, lo we're looking at issues in the nexus of food, water, and energy. And so that's something that we had started recently, and it's something that I helped to help and use some of my work and some of my research, which I'll talk about on, on, on this particular presentation. But the title of my presentation, as you can see, is Indigenous Agriculture Planting for Survival. You know, we've been doing that SIP at the Hopi Reservation for since about 3,000 years ago. Some would, say, some would say time immemorial, and so have a lot of the tribes here in the United States been doing the same thing. And so uh, that's just the title of my presentation. That's me out there planting the old school way, um, and that's how it all began. You know, that's how it all began. So I think, you know, one of the main things, in, and one of the main things when we talk about archaeology, we talk about preservation, as she just said, is that, you know, right now, this statistic is kind of amazing that indigenous people protect 80%, 80% of global biodiversity on a mere 25% of the planet's land with less than 5% of the population. Why is that? You know, why is it indigenous people control 80% of global biodiversity? It's kind of amazing when you think about it. So, you know, we've been, we've been having these, these type of grow-outs with this diversity for a long, long time. And so, you know, it's just that that's one of the facts that I like to use because this is why it's important. This is why we're still here. So when I talk about biodiversity, not only do we have, not only do we have plant species biodiversity, here in the United States, we sit upon 5.4% 4, of what I call key biodiversity areas, even though we reside in only 2% of the land here in the U.S. The, to me, that's astronomical. But also on these plants of on these plants of rich biodiverse species biodiversity, we also have language biodiversity, rich, rich languages that are out there. So they correspond in that, and I'm gonna talk about that. It's kind, of, it's kind of showing a demonstration of how we have this relationship with our environment and what, and what we use to survive in these particular conditions. Okay, so right now we're looking at current climate solutions for the short, short term. You know, and this is kind of a little bit what I wanna talk about here is like, you know, scientific derived environmental solutions are too narrowly based. Nature is still approached from a point of commodification and the market system drivers counter nature-based solutions. So what are the kind of examples that, and, I'll, and I'm gonna tell you why it's important, and, and this is why we need indigenous people in our crop biodiversity with, and also throughout the world to survive some of these things. Right now, if you, when I was up at uh, the UCAR up in Colorado, I was talking to the crop modelists, they're still, still looking at basically six major crops. Those are spread throughout the globe. So you're looking at maize, soybeans, rice, wheat, corn, and sugarcane. So they're always trying to find ways to do that. The problem with this is, is that these have a lot of variables. These have a lot of inputs that are associated with that. Things like 
uh, herbicides, pesticides, you know, a lot of them require a lot of water. And as the temperatures of the globe heat up, they're having a hard time trying to manage these. Now, their only solution to, to keep this type of adversity is basically just cover crops and no-till. That's it. When I asked them, why aren't they praising things that, that people have been eating all these generations, and they really didn't have an answer to that. Some could say it's the corporations because the corporations run a lot of all of this. And so that's kind of why they're just focusing on those six major crops. Some people say that we need to feed a billion people, so we got to use these six major crops. But these crops right here aren't really nutritional value, for one. And also, most 70% of our production in this country or in the world is, is raised on food production, is raised on only farms of one to five acres, 70% of that. And so this is just a, another way of doing these type of things. So why is this important? Because why is biodiversity is important? Because half of all global gross domestic products, the GDP relies upon nature and its biodiversity. So you would think that we sit on 80% of biodiversity. So how come we don't have half the national gross domestic product on our reservations and our territories? You know, you have to wonder about that. And so it's just because we haven't really got into the mainstream of things. But, you know, we are who we are and, you know, we represent who we do. But we're looking at, to me, this is a really good statistic. So why is this important crop and genetic biodiversity? That's the key. Imagine if we all look the same, you know? Sometimes I feel like maybe there should be 10 of Mike's out here, you know, and maybe we would be a pretty good world, right? <laughs> but then again, maybe we wouldn't. And so, you know, biodiversity is the key because, you know, when you have a, a, a monocrop, for example, if you were to get one, one uh, disease on that particular crop that could wipe out the whole crop, whereas these type of biodiversity, genetic, only genetic engineered through, through natural selection in our, in our people, we're able to survive things like diseases, droughts, and things like that. And I'll show you an example on that. So this is what I kind of wanted to compare. So I'm looking at, one time I looked at the difference between GMO seeds, genetically modified organisms, and then I looked at organisms, saw organisms, and then I looked at Hopi seeds, you know? And so look how, look how vital the, the, the Hopi seeds are and under the same conditions. There's a comparison here. Why is it like this? Why are these see, Hopi seeds outdoing these you know, uh, genetically modified um, organ, organisms? <laughs> there we go. I'm going to say GMO. How about that? And so, and so let's look at it that way. So that's kind of neat. You know? And I always say because we plant, our, we plant our seeds in a community. Nobody likes to be raised alone like over there. You know? and, I'll, and, I'll describe our, and I'll describe our system and how we plant like that. So the importance of place-based seeds, I think that's one of the things that people misconstrue. You know, because the Hopis and other tribes have drought tolerant seeds, they think that I could take my seeds, plant them in Iowa, plant them in South America, Africa, wherever, and they think they're going to have the same effect. But that's not true because these seeds are conditioned to the place that they were raised. At Hopi, we have over 3,000 years of planting this particular varieties. And we do not irrigate. That kind of stumbles people's minds because when I was at Cornell University as an undergrad, the agronomist and the crop scientist said I need 33 inches of rainfall a year to have corn. And we, only, we could raise ours in only six to 10. That's amazing. You know why? Because that's a testimony to our indigenous ingenuity. So drought tolerance. So this, is the, this, was, taken in, this was taken in July. And look how dry that ground is, but look at that plant. That's an example of drought tolerance. You know, and, and there's a number of factors, and I'll kind of explain some of the techniques, and, I, and I'll tell you where they came from. But this is kind of neat. This is a totally different type of agriculture. You know, this is community-type based agriculture with a big, big hunk of culture and spiritual values placed behind it. These aren't commodities. These are actual living human beings. So you see a cluster of people, yeah, that's a community to us. And I'll describe that as I go down the road here. So what can we learn from indigenous societies? How can we able to survive? What can we learn from people like myself and other people? What can we learn? First of all, you know, a lot of my information comes from these three books, The Footprints of Hopi History, which actually has a DNA analysis in it, The Hopi People, which has a, a, some photographs of agriculture and things like this. And this last book right here is a good book, Becoming Hopi, a History, that was produced a lot by our Hopi Culture Preservation Office. So a lot of this information that I have is glimpses, but a lot of the information that I have is from my, is from my relatives and other people out there who asked me, you know, when I talk this to credit them because, you know, they said if I do this myself that the Hopi Culture Preservation Office might get a little upset about that, but I've, I've got my thing. So the Hopi Culture Preservation Office helped, in, in, helped write all those books. So this is what I'm talking about. Indigenous resilience is based on relationships 
values and cultural belief systems. So here I go, what makes us survive? This is a petroglyph below Old Arabi, and this is our pathway to sustainability. That's how it was interpreted, that's how I was told it was. You know, each, each clan and each, and each thing that we have out here, a clan's like an extended family has their own version of it. But this is the one that I was told. What this is telling us is, this is telling us that this is the world that we're living in today. This is, there's two paths that go this way down here, this way, and then you'll see a bunch of these stick figures holding their hands, you know, and then you'll see a, a gentleman right here hunched over with his, with, his, with, his, with his planting stick going through his field of corn. And this is important in context because corn to us is like our mother. We were farmers from the beginning. And so that's how culturally important to us. There are several things in Hopi society that remind us of that and the importance of that. For one of them would be one of our baby naming ceremonies where that child is raised to the sun after two to three weeks, placed a small little piece of Hopi sweet corn pudding into their mouth so that grounds them where they're from. We also use it to make, we also use it for prayer meal also and other, and other devices. We just don't eat it. It has contextual meaning to a lot of things. It's what's it's wrapped around it. And I make this argument that when you look at that 80% that's up there and you look at where those, where those indigenous people are located, they all have a belief system and cultural relevancy to tie them and give them the discipline that they need not to overexploit or extract their natural resources. That's one of the main points. But so back to the, back to the petroglyph here. So what this is telling us, what this is telling us is that in today's society, because this kind of represents the fourth world, there were three others, you can read about that in, in Frank Waters' book and some of them uh, um, that they talk about this. But this is the world that we believe in, we believe are in, and we see a bunch of us going up this way. Now this path, what I would call, represents modernity. You know, that's a word that I learned when I was getting my master's in a philosophy class, modernity. <laughs> well, what it means to me is complications. And so this is, these are all complications that we face, all the challenges and stuff that we face. Down below, this gentleman is practicing his agriculture. He's doing his agriculture. Remember how important that is. And so what happens and what this is telling us is that as long as we continue to believe in our, in our traditions and our customs and our culture, we'll continue on until the next world. See, that line never ends. It just goes on. What this is also telling us is that this is us right now. We have a chance to go back to what I call our values. We have that chance. We don't talk about values too much. Even, 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 at, even in school, I'm a scientist, but you know, when I start bringing in values, people frown upon that. Well, how can you prove it? How can you quantify it? And I always say, well, I'm here. I have proof of concept. You know, our survival is based upon our proof of concept. So this relationship with nature, let me highlight that when I talk about this relationship with nature, I can talk about it, but unless I show this, you can't really, might not be able to understand this. But this relationship is dependent upon us working with each other, not just with the human, the human, the human relationship, but the, human to the world relationship, in fact. And so when I was building my stone house up here on the reservation up here above my fields, out of stone, this little bird was building under here, and he was built his nest out of stone. And I couldn't figure out for the longest time who was teaching who. You know, when you look at it from that concept and you give yourself enough time to slow down, and some people say pick the roses, you know, I like to watch the little ant cross the road, you know, you really can understand what relationships is really about. So also when I talk about this belief system, this is our typical Hopi agricultural calendar. The word muya is, is Hopi, it means moon in Hopi, but these are the different things that we do during our whole agricultural season. If you notice right here in the middle, this is called month, which is December, you'll notice this is a little mouse right here. What does that little mouse mean? Somebody said hantavirus. <laughs> No, it really doesn't mean that. It really means that's the time for us to tell stories. That's the time for us to reinforce our culture. December out, Hopi, is kind of a dark month for us. And so it, it's time for us to reinforce what we've been talking about so that we can teach the next generation. Very important. Stories are very important. They're not just made up things, but they actually in, and have stories to keep us on the right road. So this environment and relationships to the stabilization of the community, when I'm talking about you know, this relationship, this survival that we have, when I look at this particular pictures right here, 1915, 1901, 2015, 2015, the same crop, the system hasn't changed in at least that for a hundred years shock, and it hasn't changed probably since the last 3,000 years. It's always worked. And why has it worked? Because we've adapted to that place for a long time. Those techniques and everything like that work 
when I worked for the Natural Resource Conservation Service, they asked me to, you know, put cover crops in there or do something this or do something like that. And I said, that's not going to work. Nobody's going to buy into that. You know, so it's kind of hard for another corn, like a person, a farmer in Iowa, to tell me how to plant corn. Because we've been doing it for such a long time. Not only corn, but beans, squash, melons, things that you think would need a lot of water, but we can do without that. And I can explain that as I go. So Hopi is one of the few places I know where corn is raised to fit the environment and the environment is not manipulated to fit the corn. So what does that mean? That goes back to play space. That goes back to our survival and our capabilities. You know, without irrigation, we don't irrigate. We don't use pesticides, herbicides. A lot of our crops are managed by hand. Now we can do that because a lot of our fields are only one to five acres, so we can get out there and do that. And so it's very important. So it's, to me, it's like working with the environment, giving, taking what the environment gives you and then some, finding some way to give it back. So indigenous place-based management techniques, so let me talk about some of these techniques. So we're always talking about you know, regenerative, regenerative movement right now and bringing in, and bringing in um, new pesticides and herbicides. But if you look at this picture right here, I'm planting in an area where it's conducive to catching monsoon runoff. But look at that new soil in there. So I do not have to rotate my crops year in and year out. I have a field that's 75 years old. It still has a pH level of about 8.8 .8 on it, and that's just growing continuous corn. I challenge somebody in the United States, any farm in the United States for 75 year field to have the same pH levels if they have not used those, those phosphorus and everything else that goes with that. It's kind of neat. So food security, we're always talking about that. So what is our survival in food security? Here's another example of indigenous ingenuity. This is a, a corn roast that we have using our own sweet corn. And, and I kid you not, we harvest this because it's not waterlogged. We harvest it, we bake it in a pit and we bring it back out. And I've had corn that's 40 years old after it's dried out. I just put water on it, sit it low, soak for half a day, and boil it back up, it just pops right back up. That's food security. It's not how many Walmarts or Circle K's you have. It's, you know, for me, it's how many corn roasting pits you have, right? That's real food security. It makes a lot of sense like that. So the benefits of indigenous farming. Now, this is the important part of it. First of all, it helps reduce obesity. You know, a lot of, a lot of people, you know, we have that big problem out there on most reservations uh, that's, that's plaguing us. It reinforces family culture, it stabilizes families, environmentally friendly, it increases the concept of sharing. But most important is you learn to have a real respect for the land and what it provides by doing this time in and time out. And that starts with the youth. If, okay, the youth, and I'll talk about that. So redefining Western associated constructs. So how can we create opportunities for indigenous people to, to be part? First of all, we got to redefine the language. You know, we got to redefine the language. We got to we got to make it more conducive to, to, to our way of thinking. You know, the regenerative agriculture movements is a good one. I like it. It, it brings back soils. It, it makes sure they have the mineral contents in it. I like it. They're giving a lot of credit to indigenous people, just like permaculture. But their definition is so sterile. Why is that so? Because in this definition, it does not mention something that I came up with. And I'm a PhD, so I can put my own definition in there by darn it. And so, you know, so in here I talk about, I talk about indigenous place-based ways of knowing and land use management schemes adapted for survival. And this is the important part, which are supported by cultural belief systems and community incorporate over a millennia. That is regenerative agricultural in a nutshell because we're, we have that belief system that gives us a discipline we need not to overutilize our lands that we're from. And that's important for our survival. The other thing is, you know, when we look at the heart of evaluation, you know, there's a lot of nonprofits trying to help, but they're always wanting numbers. They always want numbers to quantify things. So I'm coming up with a different method to look at what does the community need? You know, this is, this is their matrix in, in this one particular community. The key indicators of wellness are connection to the community, connection to Zuni culture, sense of belonging, intergenerational relationships, level of enjoyment, confidence in practicing healthy traditions. It's a whole different matrix than how many people have been served, you know? What's the person's blood pressure? You know, this is all about community, and I think that's something that we all need to focus on more is community. We all need to help each other. A lot of my work is very collaborative, and I'll explain that. So redefinition calls for the reevaluation of our social norms. This is our indigenous value system. This is, this is windbreaks placed on my field. When I look at this picture over here, this is windbreaks placed on an agricultural field down here and to protect cattle. What is the difference? First of all, this is dependent upon our survival. 
We do this to survive as a society in our community. This one is more for economic gain. Well, I'll have to ask our squads, do we really want to be, do we want to really help communities or do we really want to help economics? Can we have both? You know, I believe we can, but I think we have to look at that. So this is a typical, you know, agricultural windbreak at Hopi. But the funny thing about this is that this system, the Natural Resource Conservation Service at the time, would not give us funding for this type of system. They would give us type for this type of system. Why was that? Because this type of system has not been scientifically validated. Despite 10,000 or 3,000 years of replication, it hasn't been scientifically validated according to the scientists at NRCS. So therefore, we miss out. But we're still here, so we haven't missed out that much. <laughs> and so, you know, what I'm talking about, and also what I'm also looking at, guys, is trying to relieve the, the, the status quo of indigenous people being looked at as victims. I certainly don't want to be a victim, but what causes us to be victims? Well, if you look at how the economic mindset is set up on gross domestic product, you, these are all related to that. First or third world countries, low income countries, developing nations, global north and south. That's how come we're stuck in the way we are. Now, what if we were to say, let's call these territory territories high biodiversity territories versus low biodiversity territories. And because we sit on 80% of biodiversity, what do you think we'll be at in the plane? Right at the top, right? So we won't be talking from a, a prospect of victimhood, but we'll be talking from a prospect of resiliency. And that's important. So indigenous recognition is achieved through native science demonstration projects. Now, these are some of the projects that I got going on right now. Why is that important? Because people want to have science. They want to have data. You know? And so I'm starting to do that. I'm starting to show, yes, this works. You know, this works. This is a project that I got going on at Arcasanta. that you probably read about in the paper a few months ago. But I have grow outs over here. Why am I doing this? Why am I growing these out? Because I'm trying to increase the seed supply of these particular drought variety strains to take them home and give them to my community so I can incentivize more of our tribal members to do that. Because that's so important. Because we want to be like that little guy on the picture up there who's going on that road that's going to go into the next world and not be going up that crazy path of modernity. So when I talk about indigenous ingenuity, I look at some of this cost effectiveness of this. This is not that much, but look at this. So I've got a deep row planter. You know, people are very surprised that I put corn down, at least corn, anywhere from 6 to 18 inches deep. Depends upon what I see in the, in, the, in the springtime. And I'm able to gauge our soil moisture, not by something that the U of A gives me called a soil moisture probe. I look at the typ typical different types of plants out there. I look at their, and they all have different rooting systems. And the ones who are the shallowest, if I see a lot of those plants that have shallow root systems, I know my soil moisture levels up pretty good. I'm going to have a good year. And I've been, I've been down there where I've had my soil moisture like way down and nothing was growing and I still plant it anyway. And why did I plant anyway? Because I was told a long time ago to have faith in everything I do. Faith in everything I do. So that's what it is. But so then you have a straight blade cultivator. Rather than your typical moorboard plow, we're taking some of this early introduced industrialization and tailoring it to our needs out there. So this particular cultivator only takes off about two inches of the topsoil and just cuts the weeds like a modern hoe. And so we don't lose our soil moisture. And this thing right here is, is what I call cost effective. You can put this on the back of a, th a three wheeled ATV and drag it around. You don't need a $50,000 tractor. Put it on ATV, do the same thing. You know, that's saving money because I think a lot of people don't understand is that we have a very limited amount of revenue out there on most Indian reservations. And so when you introduce something out there, you got to make sure that people, first of all, they can afford it, and also they need to know how to work it if it breaks down. And so that's important. That's all about our survival. But to me, survival is always about adaptation. If the city of Tucson were to become flooded, would you be able to adapt? Or if, it, or if the stores got empty, would you be able to adapt? You know, or would everybody come to my house like on... Um, like on that baseball movie where I see a big line of lights coming up the road or something like that. <laughs> Fill the dreams. You know, maybe so, maybe not. That'd be kind of scary, but you're always welcome. I always tell her I always welcome in my house. You know, and so when I'm talking about re indigenous, you know, re recognition of indigenous knowledge, just passed in 2021, the White House and the Office of Science and Technology Policy finally said that traditional ecological knowledge, as it's coined scientifically, and what I like to call simply the things my grandfather taught me. You know, uh, it, was, it was passed by the White House, so now we're able to start to tap into some of this conservation funding 
where we had to first of all try to prove that it was scientific. Now they're saying it is science, so we don't have to do that as much. But we still got to have methods in order to help validate that so that you know, we can buy into these federal conservation programs. So what, what are the barriers that still exist? Now don't get kind of sad because this is kind of tough to look at. And so some of it, the main one here is land tenure insecurity. What does that mean? Why do you think that we're in a situation that we're in the situation and a lot of reservations just don't have the funds or you know, we have the highest rates of, of, um, of, of poverty out there. I think it's 88%, 80% of people on the Pine Ridge Reservation don't have jobs you know, and things like that. Why is that? You know, because of land tenure and security people, we have the right to occupancy in the United States, but we do not have the right to title. And if you don't have the right to title, your land's worth nothing. You can't even get a, you can't even get a, a bank loan. So we have to fix this. It's going to take congressional action to fix this. I can't fix it. And so this lack of natural resource data, if you look at the data that we need to take advantage of federal conservation programs, we just don't have it. If you look at NOAA, for example, if you overlay their weather map on top of our reservation boundaries, you won't see hardly any of those out there. It makes no sense. And also the lack of financial capital, that's always a problem. But that, a lot of that stems from this land and insecurity. But that is not only a problem here in the United States, that is a problem throughout the globe. That's a direct result of what I call the, the, the colonization stuff and things like that. But that's what happens. So solutions presented but not enforced. There's the other thing. We have all these things up in here, alternative funding arrangements, uh, Indian Agriculture Resource Management Act, lack of indigenous participation in the indigenous making process are some of our barriers. But, but they're not really barriers because they're there, right? But if, for example, the Indian Agriculture Resource Management Act of 1993 allows us to take over conservation programs and produces scholarships for Indian kids who want to go to college in agriculture, but it's never been funded. You know, I used to work for Congress, and so when, I, when you have a bill, if it's, even if it has legislation, if it doesn't have funding behind it, it just sits there. You know? So the solutions are here, guys, but they need to be reinforced. They need to be reinforced in order for us to have full access to what's out there. You know? And I think, you know, what's his name? Russell Means said this one time at the, at the Indian Affairs Committee meeting a long time ago in 1985. He says that, you know, in this great country of ours, we call the United States, American Indians are allowed to do everything except be American Indian. Think about that. You know, that's kind of a, those are kind of harsh words, but it makes a little bit of sense. Because of our practices and our laws and policies, we need to change to create true equity. So upscaling for it. Now, when I, when everybody likes to use upscaling, but for me, upscaling is, should only be used for the benefits of community that can be accomplished when it truly meets the needs of the community and not the needs of the corporations. That makes sense like that. You know, for my example, people say, why don't you go out and raise Hopi corn everywhere, make a lot of money? Somebody called, they said, how can we make your traditional foods more vogue? You know, when you talk to native chefs, some of them have actually quit because they're catering to, to that niche out there and their own people aren't eating as, as good as, as other people that are paying $100 a plate. So they're starting to feel conscious about that. So we need to level the playing field a little bit. And this is some of the stuff I do here is going to do that. So when you look at travel and food security, all these dark spots are almost all on our reservations. It's not that good out there, right? That's not that good out there. But you know, so how can we do this? What are the community-based solutions and collaborations that we can do? So now we can get happy again, now that we got all the bad stuff out of the way. So how can we, how can we help with this? First of all, you know, what, what I'm doing right now is you know, working for extension is you know, this continuance of environment and culture knowledge for the next generation. So I'm able to take kids like these young kids out there, take them to my field, talk about science, like agronomists, botanists, because we do all that thing, and hydrologists. You know, but I'm also, also talking about the importance of culture, the name driver of why we were still here. You know, and so sure enough, by the end of the day, when I'm talking, I says, what does everybody want to be? They don't say a fireman, a policeman. They say, I want to be a hydrologist. I want to be an agronomist, Mike, you know? <laughs> and that's so cool, you know, because they're learning that at a young age, right? I've got something right now I'm going to work with the school board in the city of Tucson where I want to make sure that every child in Head Start has a cup, has seeds, has soil, and some water to plant with on their first day. Why is that important? First of all, it shows them that relationship. It understand, they understand where things are coming from. And the last thing, it puts a smile on a child's face. Isn't that cool? You know? So I'm going to be talking to the school board, and we'll see how that goes. But I hope it works out. You know, out, of, out of the 83, out of the 83 um, schools here we have in Tucson, and, and Moses, Moses over there at the, at the school garden program, we have, we have gardens in 71 of them. 
you know, so that's pretty good for, for down here in Arizona. So this revitalization of the American food system, I just started a nonprofit called the Fred Aptivy Foundation, named after my grandfather, because my grandfather would help everybody. We had these conferences in Prescott. He'd make sure everybody was fed, you know, so I wanted to do that something. But this is going to fo solely focus on growing out traditional varieties at Hopi, possibly put in a food bank. We actually have a food hub up there right now. During the COVID period, for example, you know, we had St. Mary's food truck come over there, but they would go back half full with perishable items because we had no place to store it. You know, and I don't know if you've ever been in places like when these big things come in, they give you a 60 pound back of, of green peppers or potatoes, 60 pounds. That's a lot of food. We, where are you going to put that at? You know, and so, you know, but we could have held on to that food and just slowly distributed throughout the community, but a lot of it came back, and that's unfortunate. So I'm trying to fix that. And so also the Native American Agricultural Fund, we, when I was there, we put together this beautiful infrastructure map, what will be needed in Indian country to help us out. Food processing centers, you know, food hubs, places to, to have things grown out more. Uh, and everything in there. It's a beautiful plan, and more people are looking at that now. You know, $3 billion, that's all it costs, $3 billion over 10 years to get Indian country where it needs to be. Not only is it going to help the, the Indians, but it's also going to help the non-Indians when you put these food hubs in, because people have places to go. During COVID, for example, in Oklahoma, a lot of people couldn't find a where to get a shot, so a lot of them, so the reservations took them into their own IH, Indian Health Service Hospital and gave them shots there. So we're still willing to help, but how many people are willing to listen, you know? And so that's, that's where I'm at on that one. So some of the current stuff that I'm working on, I'm developing a process to make sure indigenous communities can benefit from research related to seeds. I have something at the university right now which you basically have them look at, look at seeds as, as human subjects. So when you do a test and you do research on that, the communities will benefit where those seeds came from. They'll get some benefit of that. It's important. Also, the intellectual property. I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do is put seeds under the NAGPRA, under the Native American Game Repatriation Act. So that, we can, so that we can declare our intellectual property values, things like that's important. Uh, growing out seeds, and I talked about that, nutritional analysis, because everything we have to do has to have a nutritional analysis, believe it or not. When you want to do these food to, food to table, pro, farm to table programs, you have to have a nutritional analysis in order to get those foods in there. And also this mitigation risk, so I'm doing some grow outs here at the University of Arizona, looking at the different water methods to increase the amount of indigenous agriculture. But I want you to make a stark look at this, and you see there's economics is not involved in this. There's no word economics mentioned in this at all. Because I don't need that. I'm just trying to maintain the health of our communities out here. Does that make sense a little bit? You know? So that's part of our survival. I'm just wanting to do everything I can to bring this to the forefront so people can understand that. Now, what does this have to do with archaeology? It has a lot to do with archaeology because you know, we've experienced these things before, and we're just trying to find new ways to adapt and to conserve what we have in the long run. So this community versus economics, so that's kind of the last thing I wanted to talk about. So when we, when we leave here, we got to ask ourselves, you know, are, are we looking at our community or are we still looking at economics or can we have both? You know, I, I really don't know if we can have both. I think we can. I've seen it. But, you know, for me, it's all about community first. It's about taking care of something that I was given that I'm only passing knowledge on that I have to benefit everybody else. It's creating opportunities for others. You know, I went to school. I got my PhD, and my dad says, now you have more responsibility because now you have an obligation to help more people. And that's important to me. And so that's why I'm here. And so thank you very much. Could you tell us a little bit, a little bit more about uh, soil pH? I know zero about it. <laughs> well, soil pH, you know, there's a thing called phosphorus, potassium, and nitrogen. And so the pH levels have the acidity in there to, to, to that, 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 that the plants intake up in order for them to actually prosper. And so like for example, corn takes a tremendous amount of nitrogen. And so you have to have those pH levels just right and it's kind of a combination of everything to make sure that you're going to have a good crop. And that's what we do a lot of. We try to find ways to, to make sure that we have the quantity and it's efficient and everything like that. But unfortunately, you know, our, one of our number one problems here is, that, is agricultural runoff. That's one of our biggest problems. And that's due to all that stuff that they're putting on there to make those, those plants look pretty <laughs> and things like that. And so that's kind of what pH does. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a term that we're, you're, you're trying to put into your soil so that it's balanced enough so that you can have good crops. I'm curious about your work at Arcosanti and if you're able to talk about that at all, what you're doing there. Yeah, I've, I've, been, I've been growing there for about two years now. Uh, there used to be a, a, a family of Hopis growing there long before that. Uh, and so what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm taking a couple of varieties at a time and I'm growing them out down there uh, so that we can, so I can bring those seeds back home and distribute to the communities. 
See, they have water down there. See, they have an unlimited amount supply of water where we can do drip irrigation and things like that. At Hopi, we don't have that. But what I'm also being, being very careful of is that I'm making sure that, you know, we only, we only have two years at the most of drip irrigation, two years of flood irrigation, because I do not want to use the dry vitality of our plants, not only our corn, but our beans, our melons, and our squash, because you got to understand that it's, it's, it's hard to raise things in the desert. We don't always get a crop. We don't always do that. But we're, but we're losing our seeds pretty continuously, and so I'm trying to bring back those varieties in a way that we can all benefit you know, as, as a people. Because those, those, those varieties that we raise are very nutritionally dense because we don't use any of those things, and so they're taking up what, what the earth is giving us. You know, so that relationship continues. So thank you. This is all very interesting. Uh, and I'm just curious. So you have 75 acres, and I'm just curious if you, you can account like, where does your crop go who do you give it to? How does it get to your community? Does it get beyond the community? I guess it does. Well, no, I have one to five acres, and so you know, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of uh, um, our distribution mechanism is 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 the women are in charge of that. And that's one thing I should always mention is that we live in a matrilineal society. So it's the women who get the harvest when it comes off the field. They they go out and look at the different traits on that to to, to save seeds for the next year. You know, they're also, they also own the fields. The women own the fields, the house, and everything. And so I'm just kind of like Shrek out there. I just move things around. <laughs> and so, but, but they're very important. So, you know, that's, that's how it's distributed. So basically it's distributed to the family and then the clan and so forth, and it kind of goes out that way. It's a pretty good food system, but we just need the quantities to increase to distribute more of those good quality products. Can you talk a little bit about the land tenure problem? Because... I was interpreting that for you to say that individuals need to be able to own land, but I don't think that's what you're saying. No, no, it's 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 basically it's basically there's no title. That means like if you have a if you own a house and you own the area around that, that's yours. That belongs to you. You can pretty much do whatever you want to, depends upon where you live. But with with with, with on Indian lands, you cannot do that. You know, you have to go to the Bureau of Indian Affairs or the Bureau of Land Management in order to sign things like leases, things like that. So you don't have control of it. You just can't go sell it. You know, and it was it was started that way because unfortunately there were people coming in and they were just taking the land and things like that. I don't know if you've seen that Osage movie called The Call or whatever, called The Wildflower. You know, it's it's kind of like that. And so you know, we don't have real title to it, so we we can't put anything up for collateral. You know, when we want to make an investment. You know, some of the tribes around here they've did a pretty good job. You know, investing their stuff. You know, with with all the businesses they have that are huge that are close to these huge popular. Uh, center, so they're doing okay, but the ones that are way out there, big land races like the Navajo Nation and things like that, we just don't have that. We're dependent upon the federal government. You know, I mean, for example, the, the recent Supreme Court case that was Arizona versus the Navajo Nation when it talked about water, access to water, they said, yeah, you have your water rights, but we're no longer going to be responsible for doing feasibility studies, providing infrastructure, you know, because of that ruling. And so what do we do then? You know, we don't have the capital anyway. We don't have that. You know, um, and that's that's unfortunate, but and I don't know how we can do that, but we, but we're held in trust by the federal government. They're like our big brother to some extent. They have a responsibility, and so, uh, but at the same time, we're trying to find ways so that we can shuck some of that stuff. And I think one of our big ways to show that is through our food systems, trying to reinvent that to to create the independency that we need rather than the dependency that we currently have. So that's kind of what that's that's what it means like land tenure. We just don't have the rights to title, and that's throughout the globe. Hey, uh, with all your uh, travels throughout the North America and stuff abroad, what are some of the successes or challenges that you've seen or that maybe we can take back or share with them? Well, one of the biggest challenges that I see, even you know, I spoke at COP28 a couple of times and I listened to what was going on over there. I mean, the, the, the people are still aren't willing to give up their fossil fuels, but that's not the biggest thing. People aren't, are afraid to give up their power. You know, that, that bothers me a lot. But then I see on the other side of that, I see a little bit more, you know, indigenous people being involved in some of the discussions now where they weren't before, you know, because science is looking for an answer. They're looking for ways to kind of balance it out a little bit, and so are the people who are these, with these big corporations are. But and so that gives me help, you know, when I start seeing things like, you know, how are we gonna how are we gonna bring in uh, tribal data sovereignty? How are we gonna keep what we find out there and make sure that the tribes benefit? They're starting to do that now, because they have to, because their survival, even their survival, depends upon that. You know, because all the genetic diversity, basically, in my mind, is out on these out on, out on these indigenous territories. So they're starting to ask some questions now. They're trying to do that, and it's not only, it, but it's not necessarily the tribal government, but it's also the nonprofit organizations like the the Rockefeller Foundation, 
you know, they're making big headway into that kind of stuff too. And, and even our university is doing, you know, this year, this year I was able to, you know, ask the university because we're a land grant institution, we have a, a pretty, pretty not so good history, but I was able to have the rather just the land management, I was able to, to have them click on something now that would show how the University of Arizona was, was, was came into play and, and the land that it came from and what the benefits were. Just so, just for transparency, you know, I think that's one of our main things. And that's one thing that gives me hope is that we're starting to see that transparency. Not only how things were done, but how we can help move things forward in, in an equitable fashion. The pictures you showed for Hopi were mostly like dry farms. Mm -hmm. And I remember visiting many years ago and seeing these spectacular spring fed mm -hmm. uh, gardens. And I was just wondering whether that was part of the program and part of the solution as well. Oh, yes, it is. Because, uh, you know, like in Hope Villa, they have a good one. Even at Weepo Wash, they're starting to, the tribe and the cultural preservation office are starting to move and starting to clean out some of the old, sp old springs and things like that. And so that is a big part of it too, you know? I mean, uh, so we're starting to move in that direction too. But, and you know, down in lower Munkapee, there in Tuba City, we, people still do irrigate there to some extent and things like that. So that's still going on in diversity, but most of the reservation still relies upon dry farming. It's a little harder now because, you know, back in the introduction of cattle, we had three major washes that would slice through the reservation. But when cattle came out there, they started overgrazing and those auroras just got deeper and deeper and deeper. So they're not utilized like they, like they were at one time. Back when we saw uh, a writing from, uh, there was a book published by the U of A Press that talked about the abundancy of, of Hopi crops during like when the Spanish came out of here and the priests were saying, we can't take any more food. We've got so much of it. You know, and even my grandfather back in his day, he remembers when the grass used to be up to a horse's belly and how, how, how fertile that soil was. But it's not like that anymore because of those cut downs right now. But I'm just trying to figure out little niches that I can use to, to help us benefit from that. But, but water like that is very important for us. And water isn't really looked at as a commodity. It's looked at as almost like a spiritual force. So it's very valued. And I always like to say, people, we do a lot with less. <laughs> Then we do with more, and I think that's important. Those values are very important, so that's kind of how I would address that question. But thanks for asking that. I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not this is something that is unique to the Hopi people, uh, or do similar practices and agricultural procedures or whatever processes exist for other reservations around the country? And how can we, I don't know, promote these kinds of things across across the country. Well, well, the non-irrigated uh, um, agriculture is, is is real specific to Hopi, but it's also specific to Navajo too, because they they were in the same area. Uh, back when Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon were populated, they, that was dry farming there too. There wasn't that much going on in there, but but nowadays it's it's really it's a lot of these examples come from Hopi. You know, there's places in Africa that have similar that had similar practices, but a lot of them have been erased because of the new cropping systems that come in. And same thing with like, Indian to some extents. And so uh, it's just it's just a little harder to to do that anymore. I mean, for me, you know, when they talk about dry irrigation, they set up in Oregon, they do dry irrigation, but they that means that that means they don't flood irrigate, but they have 33 something inches of rainfall a year, you know? And so that's not dry, that's not dry farming to me. Six to 10 inches is dry farming to me. I mean, down here, I've got friends down here in TO, they actually still plant the traditional way. They don't put their seeds in until July in dry soil. And they put, there's paddocks that are formed and they're on little slopes. They know where the slopes are at. So when it does hit a bronze suit, boom, it pops up. And then you have things like 60 day corn. You can get a crop in 60 days. You know, corn in America usually it goes by growing degree days. The most of the corn that we eat in the supermarket is 120 degree growing degree days, 140 growing degree. It takes that long to actually produce a crop. But it's a fast growing corn down there. You know, my concern is, is that we need to figure out how to keep this genetic information in the hands where it comes from because you have people like Bayer now who basically have a short variety of corn. Where they got that gene from, I don't know, but they're going to use it to spread out the world to say this, this does pretty good. Well, I could have told them that for a long time. Of course it does good, you know. But we're not getting any benefit from that, you know, and so we're trying to figure out ways. Well, how can we show that? And that's part of that's part of trying to create our own patents and our own ways of doing things. But we've got to educate our young people to do it ourselves. We can't rely upon a, a federal system or our research system to do that for us. We need to learn these things as we go. And so we're still catching up, so to speak. But yeah. Hi, I'm. Thank you for the presentation. I'm from Hilla River, mm -hmm. and I saw one of your PowerPoint or one of the slides talk about. Um, the natural conservation system mm -hmm. and it's true what you said about the leases for tribal nations it takes us forever to get them from the Bureau of Indian Affairs mm -hmm. you know, that goes 
but one of the things I hope you could ad advocate for from the NCRS or how natural, mm -hmm. you know, natural resource conservation yeah, service, yeah. They they ask that tribes or small land farmers, they need to have two years in production in order to get funded. Mm -hmm. I'm just sharing that as those are some of the challenges tribes have that we would like to go into production faster. However, those policies really stump us from going any faster. Well, it's like that. There's a there's an irrigation rule out there that says you have to have at least five years of irrigation. Now, I, I take a bucket to my bean plants of just water. That's irrigation. But it's not irrigation to the, to the Western model of things. And so we need to figure out ways to, to do that. And I've been telling, I have a meeting with NRCS tomorrow in, up in Denver, Denver, to talk about these issues once again. I wrote a paper on it. And it's up to them to do something about that, you know. And, you know, I, I apply, you know, I, like Ramona Farms over there in Gila River, you know, they grow a lot of temporary beans, but they have to pay for that specialized crop out of their cotton and alfalfa. The government needs to be switch things around and give subsidies for small and traditional crops like that. Also, the reservations in southern Arizona need to put at least an acre away that would be good for, like, indigenous foods to give to our communities. That's the other problem. We're, I'm trying to get them to do that also. We have the infrastructure there already. But, but what I'm doing here at the U of A is, is, to, is to look at the water management principles so I can give them the best technology and that they can do it rather than just give them something and just let it sit there, you know? And so there's a lot of that, there's a lot of that hands-on stuff. And so you're welcome. My question is, and it might be a long one, but what makes you feel so confident that economics and agriculture cannot prosper together? Well, it's that it's not that I, I, don't, I feel that they can't prosper together. It's, it's, how, the, it's how they're working on it. You know, I... I have, a, I have a thing that if, that if we weren't so, the market system geared, is geared for one thing. It won't work this way it, 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 if it's based upon quantity and efficiency. Because by doing that, you're cutting a lot of people out. You know, there's a lot of small farmers across America who could benefit what they call CSAs, community, um, forgot what that stands for, but there, a bunch of people get together, they make a rules, have them. it's like a co-op. You know, if we had a lot more looking at quality, a lot of these people produce quality products like, like Farmer Frank and things like that. And so if we're able to have more of that, then the people would benefit for more from it economically because economics, from what I understand, is all based upon supply and demand. And so we need to figure out ways to do that. So that's, that's, where, the, that's where the connection comes. That's the middle road right there. But it's hard for people to change their mindset, at least, at least in the federal government, that they need to support these small farmers more than what they're doing to put the quality back into our diet rather than, you know, the end results of that being high rates of diabetes and cancer and stuff like that. We need to focus more on the quality. And so that's where I can get on that. So when I, when I've, when I've bashed the economic side of big agriculture, I'm just using what I've, what I've seen out there. And, and um, some people say it's efficient, but at the same time, I don't know if it really is. And, and whose efficiency is it at the, end, at the end of the day? You know, that's what kind of questions I have to ask. I don't know if I quite answer that question, but that's how I, that's how I see it. For our online audience, um, if you haven't yet, please type your questions in the Q&A. But I have a few here that I will ask Michael. If you, um, one reads, uh, the, uh, they've, read, they've, read, they've read that lime makes corn a complete food. Does Hopi have lime available to them? No, we don't. And a, and a lot of that stuff is, is brought in in what they call alluvial flood plans or oxygen farming, where we plant in areas that are conducive to bringing new soils and new nutrients into the field. So, yeah, we don't use lime. Um, can you say more about the roasting pit and how it's used for preserving corn? Well, the roasting pit is made out of stone. It's stone line, you know. Um, it's in the ground about three feet. And, and, what, and what's practice is that we, once, we get the, once we get the corn out, we use this grease wood at the bottom of this pit to, to heat it up takes quite a bit of time to heat it up, and then we drop all that corn in there. And what that does, by sealing it and covering it up overnight and bring it out the next day, then what it does is it kind of acts like a dehydration process. It, 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 it takes most of the, 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 the moisture out of it, and it seals it in there. So all we got to do is take it out of there and hang it up, and then we can use it many years later. It, it can last forever that way when it's preserved like that. You know, and, and it's preserved like that because we live in such a dry climate, right? We don't have humidity like back east. So we're not really worried about mold or anything like that. But by roasting it like that, takes care of all those things that can, that can really hurt it. Um, what's the ideal pH for corn? I believe it's around 8.5 to 8.8. .8, and that ours is about 8.8 .8 right now, I mean, at least on my field that I tested on that. And then I have someone here um, from New Mexico talking about how the dr drought really affected their crops. 
um, last year, and they were asking how yours did and if it was better. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine, mine kind of, mine kind of, you know, at, at Hopi we have, you know, we have a lot of different variables. We have cutworms, crows, you know, um, sometimes too hot, sometimes too cold, lack of water, you know, windstorms, you know, disease, and we have all these things that we have to look at. But you know, my crop this year. Uh, about about a third of it got tanked out by cutworms, which are little things that go are in the soil, and then they t they gnaw at the bottom of the plant there where the root is, and they just the plant just falls over. The other thing is that it was real hot this summer, and and being not responsible like I should have been, I'm supposed to thin that clump of corn out, which is about you know we plant anywhere from 10 to tw 10 to 15 kernels per hole, and so I should have thinned them out to at least six to seven when it starts getting warmer because we're all, they're all competing for soil moisture. And then during even this year, I probably should even thin those out to three to four. Then I would have had a really good crop with yours being about so big, but I didn't do that. And so I lost a lot of my crop to heat stress. Mm -hmm. And the last part of my crop, which I had for corn, I was gone for 10 days, only 10 days. And I came back and it looked like, you know, it looked like someone had just laid my field out. It was like little bodies of corn everywhere by the crows. And so I didn't get that. But this year I've got an agreement with with the school to be out there for those three months between August and the time I harvest so that doesn't happen again. I think that's the thing that people don't understand is that you need to be with your crops because you need to take care of your relatives, right? No one else is going to do it unless you do it yourself because too many things can go wrong. So, yeah. Do you know if um, if there are any Hopi seeds in the National Seed Storage Lab? Oh, yeah, there's a bunch in there. I mean, if you that's called GRIT. I forgot what that stands for, but the USDA has a bunch of them. The problem with, the, with that is that we can't get access to them. You know, researchers and institutions can have access to those. We can't. Even in museums, we can't. So I'm working on those issues. Uh, we do have, there are seeds in these different organizations. Whether or not they're true or not, they may have came from there, but they've been propagated with water so much that when we take seeds back home, they don't do well at all because they, they're needing that extra, they're needing all that water to grow like they used to. And so it's taken us 3,000 years to get to that dry adaptation. And you know, you put five or six years or maybe 10 years of, of, of flood irrigation on that particular plant, it's gonna lose its drought vitality. There's just no way they're gonna preserve that. And so, uh, so you know, we gotta we gotta keep what we gotta do, and we gotta also grow them in the places they they were they're grown originally, so they can do they can pick up those things, you know. And I and I kind of, you know, I'm writing an essay on the importance of seeds, and I would almost compare them to, kind of like the boarding school kids, because you know those kids were taken away, they were lost their identity, they lost their culture, and seeds. A lot of our seeds are just like that. They don't know where they're at. They don't know how to grow anymore. And so I'm just trying to bring them home. I just want to bring them home so that we can not only force our culture, but also increase the biodiversity and conservation that we're good at. And so that's where I'm at at that. I have a, another question, which would be a good one to wrap up the evening, but um, they ask how they can support this work and um, if there and other work of indigenous farmers. Well, there's like, you know, Indigenous Resilience Center. We're, we're starting to work in outreach like that, but there's my own organizations at home, like like uh, the Hopi, Hopi, Hopi Tutsqua Permaculture, the Hopi Foundation, and we also have the Hopi, Hopi Zuni Youth Enrichment Project. There's just a number of organizations out there. I wanted to start a podcast here to talk, to just focus on Native American um, uh, grassroots food organizations because there's quite a few of them. When I used to work for the Native American Agricultural Fund, we were helping fund about 300 of them, and that was just hitting the type of the tip of the iceberg. And so, for me to support things is first of all we need to figure out what's going on out there, have, have the awareness. But also, but also kind of, you know, do your own research and, and, and see what you can find out there. There's tons of organizations out there. I'm just now getting the big nonprofit sector involved more in Indian country. And a lot of people are helping me do that in order to, in order to get the benefits from that out there. And so uh, just, but it's like everything else, you know, you don't, you don't see that many Native American stories on mainstream TV, you know. And so our, our problem is just try to just get the recognition. So rather than looking at equity, as I talked about, I'm looking at recognition first to get off, off the museum walls and into your living room. <laughs> and so that's kind of where I'm at on that, so. Thank you so much. We have really greatly enjoyed tonight's presentation. Thank you so much for everyone who came out and for everyone online as well. So thank have, you. have a great night and thank, thank you, you Dr. Johnson. Thank you.